and attention to you through your word. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. I cannot wait to open mail this time of year. It is the only time of the year that you will see me go to the mailbox like a little kid waiting for a Christmas gift. But I will run to the mailbox before Jen gets there because I can't wait to find those Christmas cards in the mail. It is indeed that time of season. And I'll bring them in sometimes before I open them. But sometimes I'll bring them in and then I'll slowly open the top seal of them. And I take a peek at the return address and almost begin to preview or forecast the little smiles and faces that I'm going to see on the card inside. That envelope invites me in to see and enjoy more beauty than I could if I didn't open it. And in such a greater way, our four-week journey through Psalm 19 is reminding us to open and appreciate not the envelopes of Christmas cards, but the 66 books of the Bible that God reveals himself to us. See, those Christmas cards further our relationship with one another. They tell me about the past, the previews for the future, and what a family's doing in the present. And King David, through these four weeks, has been reminding us that in this ancient poem of praise, we are hearing about all that God has done and is doing and will do. That we've heard about general revelation in nature verse 1 to 6. And then in verse 7 to 14, we've heard of his special revelation in Scripture. Another way to think of it is the God who is powerful to make all things, Elohim, and show his glory in the world, has now used three weeks in verse 7 to 14 to speak his gospel in the word. And so in Psalm 19, I hope you have enjoyed reading this card from our Creator. And today we hit the last few verses of our four-week journey, and we see that not only is God's word powerful, not only is it practical, it, not only is it perfect and precious, but today it is practical. I got no more P words left. <laughs> I'm gonna stumble over another one. <laughs> today we see that God's word is practical, and what verse 11 to 14 shows us is how in the world is it practical. Well, first, we're going to see that there's a reward, a prize for our souls. And then we're going to see a revelation of our need for God's pardon. And then we're going to see a rescue from the prideful sins by his power. And then finally, a renewal of our praise that's focused on him alone. So let's begin in verse 11. David continues his parade of praise from verse 10, as he says in verse 11. Moreover... By them is your servant warned, and keeping them, there is great reward. Speaking of Christmas and the holidays, I don't know, growing up, my mom used to love watching the Thanksgiving Macy's Day Parade. I don't even know if they still do that, but they, they still do, apparently. But in the Macy's Day Parade, down the streets of New York City, it's float after float, and it's such beautiful like displays of color and massive turkeys as tall as skyscrapers that you can't look away. And in verse 7 to 14, David has been giving us reason after reason not to turn away from God's word. The law of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the precepts, the commands, these things are perfect. They revive the soul. They rejoice the heart. They make us wise. And last week, if you remember, they're greater than money and honey. They taste sweeter than even a little bit of a drop of honey from a beehive, or contemporarily, like if you have a bowl of Honey Nut Cheerios and the milk that soaks up that goodness and you just have to drink it down. And it's even not only greater than honey, but it's greater than gold. It's greater than hitting the jackpot, Powerball, lotto, whatever it's at nowadays. Because in God's word, we are reminded that God has so loved us that despite us, trying to find satisfaction in other things, he has given his son, Christ Jesus, the most precious of persons to live, die, and rise in order that we could be saved. And so as we open the word, what we are being invited to do is not merely to read as a ritual, but to relate with a person. Not just reading our Bibles. David is not pushing us 
and saying, just read, 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 read your Bibles and be a good Christian. He is not pushing you with duty. He is inviting and pulling you to see beauty. And that's what this poem, this parade of praise is intended to do. Float after float, illustration after illustration to lure us in, including the idea that we need warning from the dangerous things of this world. Look at what he said in verse 11. He says, moreover, by them is your servant warned. Is your servant warned? One of the rewards of scripture, it warns us away from what is dangerous for our souls. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and they love to help mommy cook in the kitchen. But they don't always know when the stove is hot. And so we tell them, boys, don't touch it. It's hot. And Josiah learned a few weeks ago, it's hot. It's actually hot. And when God's word says, the wages of your sin is death, the wages of your sin is death. And when God's word says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, well, that includes you and I. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so scripture warns us about what's dangerous for our souls and sin, but it warns with an invitation to receive Christ Jesus as the means through which we are protected from God's just wrath. Just as God warned Noah, before the flood, and the world was consumed, submerged under his just wrath against sin then. Just as God warned Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because he knew what was good for them. And so in scripture, we're going to come across passages that warn us to stay away from what would ruin us. And so the first question I have for us, when you read passages about God's warning, do you read them humbly or flippantly? Do you think they apply to everyone else but me? And not only do you read them humbly, but do you speak them lovingly? See, if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and if indeed the wages of sin is death, well, then the greatest and most loving thing you could do for those who don't yet know Jesus is tell them that. Not in a way that beats over their heads, but in a way that lures their heart and says, I love you so much that I have to warn you about what would otherwise ruin you for eternity. And I have to let you know that there is something greater, and his name is Christ Jesus, and he would liberate your soul and bring you fullness of joy in his presence if you would believe in him, if you would give him your sin and receive his forgiveness, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if you've not done that, if you've not responded to his irresistible grace, don't delay delay. I warn unto new life. But scripture also warns us, as you see on the verse uh, a screen ahead of, above me, and we are warned not only about sin, but about suffering. This time of year, speaking of things that you need to be warned about, I often warn other people when they talk about Christmas shopping, don't go to the Annapolis Mall on Saturday afternoons. Don't even think about it. I made the rookie mistake our first year here, and I forever live to regret it. And in a greater way, as the Annapolis Mall doesn't function as is designed and you would experience the rest of the year, in a greater way, we live under the curse and the effect of sin now. That the world struggles under death and disease and depravity. We walk a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit in this life. And we realize that things are harder than they should be. And Romans 8 tells us this very, this very truth. In Romans 8, 22, I'm going to read this passage that describes the suffering we're in. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Guys, at the holidays, we feel this big pain. Some of you have just had the first big milestone with an empty seat of a loved one that you would have loved to share with your baby. Some of you are looking ahead to the next few weeks and wanting to buy presents for anyone and everyone in your family, and you realize the bank account's a little 
more shallow than you'd like it to be. Some of us continue to walk about in physical pain and stress and turmoil that many people may not otherwise see from the outside, but you feel it crippling you from the inside. And so scripture warns us with passages that this world is not our home, that our citizenship is in heaven, and it warns us to say that in the moment, you don't need to be falsely stoic or fatally sunk. Let me say that again. Scripture warns us about suffering so that you are not falsely stoic and pretend as though there's no big problem or fatally sunk, where you say there is no hope in this time and age, that God has left me and he doesn't care about me. But instead, what Scripture tells us in John 16, verse 33, we read this reality that Jesus has come to give us hope. And in John 16, verse 33, he tells us, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, this world is not operating as God designed. We are plagued by the curse of sin. And so death, disease, and depravity are part of it. But Christ, who lived, who died, who rose, now reigns at the Father's right hand. And the one who had power to rise from the dead is imminently returning. And guess what he's going to do on his second return? He's going to obliterate all sin, sorrow, and suffering. There is never going to be a bad day at the mall, so to say. There's never going to be an empty seat at the Thanksgiving table. There's never going to be another tear, another funeral, another hospital visit. There's never going to be another worry about our finances or our vocations or our family tension that feels as thick as, as an icy morning, ice on a cold morning. Jesus is coming back. And scripture warns us against the suffering in this world in order that we would have hope. See, verse 11 says, in keeping them, there is great reward. And you've begun to taste some of those rewards. But again, look at that passage. It says, in keeping them. There, there's like this command that's laden within it, isn't there? Like, we should be keeping them. Keeping, as in continuous, like there's no end to it. And then them, as in comprehensive. And what he's talking about is all of the Bible, all of God's word that constantly, continuously, comprehensively, we should have these truths in us. See, I told you we love those cards. And we love them so much that my wife will, on the back side of them, get the, bl the, painter, the blue painter's tape out, and we'll put so much tape on those cards that we then deck the halls and the walls, anywhere in our home with them, so that they stay up. We keep them fresh through at least Valentine's Day. Some of them make it to St. Patrick's Day. We love to keep these things because they tell us of the reward of relationship. They tell us about these families, these pictures we love to see. And in a greater way, verse 11 is saying we should do the same with God's word, that we should be taping his promises, so to say, on the halls of our heart, that we should be in the word so regularly that it begins to be the way through which we see the world. But, unfortunately, you and I know that's not the pattern of our lives. We should, but we don't. It's kind of like a, a diet between Thanksgiving and New Year's. We wish it was a little bit better than it actually was. And in our Bible reading, we go through seasons where we long to be in God's word, but we feel kept from it. And yet David, again, is inviting us to see beauty, not pushing with duty, but there's something good. And so my question, because of God's grace and for your good, is what most keeps you from God's word in this season? What most keeps you from time spent with the Lord in his word? And then where might you also be tempted to reject or rebel against God's word instead of receive it? because we're meant to be keeping it continuously and comprehensively, that these are indeed laws that bring us life. See, David says in keeping them, there is great reward. We need hope. We have not kept them. But the promise of Scripture tells us that God keeps his people even when we don't keep our commitment to him. 
And the great news of the Bible is that God has shown his commitment to us, even in the Old Testament. We sang about him in the Old Testament with some of the songs that Larry led us through this morning. And in the Old Testament, it was called a covenant, where God entered into a commitment to pursue the good of his people, even at cost to his comfort, that he was always moving towards them, even when they were moving away from, from, from him. And he proves this in fullness when Christ Jesus came and God shows his love for us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And so God, the lawmaker, sends Jesus, the law keeper, to save lawbreakers like you and I. And that is not original to me. That's from a much wiser pastor. But what we are reading in the scriptures is that God always delivers before he decrees. So yes, we should read our Bibles. Only once we celebrate that he is the one who has saved our souls. That God gives life even before the law. And this was the pattern in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Before Moses communicated the law to the Israelites, listen to what he reminded them that God did to keep them. In Deuteronomy 4, he says, Because he loved your fathers. Listen to who God is while you write this. He loved your fathers. He chose their offspring. He brought you out of Egypt with his own presence, by his great power. Therefore, therefore, you shall keep his statutes and commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you. God keeps his people. And therefore, motivated by grace, let's keep his word. Because in his word is great reward. In his word, we, we, this practically means we keep God's word joyfully, not begrudgingly. That this is not a ritual to check. This is a relationship to enter into. So we keep God's word joyfully because Jesus has kept us for all eternity. And therefore, because, and there's some passages that will help remind you if you're ever feeling like you're just having to read your Bible for duty, Remember what Jesus keeps you from. He keeps you from death. He keeps you from shame. He keeps you from fear. And those are some passages that I often go to to warm my soul up when it feels a little icy. And then also, if we keep the word joyfully, we then keep it continuously. On the screen above me, some ways that you can practically keep God's word this week. Encourage you, according to this verse, keep it continuously. Have a plan to be in God's word, because we don't just roll out of bed thinking, you know what, I'm going to read my Bible every single day. And so on the inside of the handout we gave you this morning, on the, uh, the brochure today that we gave you, you'll see our 2023 church Bible reading plan. I wanted to give you five weeks to get ready. Five weeks to get ready. And later this afternoon, you'll get an email that describes it a little bit more including a simple daily guide for how you can engage God via the word. So keep the word continuously by having a plan. Keep it comprehensively. David just told us in keeping them, all of them, all of them, We're not reading our Bible like a buffet where you pick what you like and discard the rest, but keeping them, even the passages that may not agree with what your initial disposition is, but because it's all inspired by a holy and perfect God for our good. Be willing to submit, but then also keep God's word congregationally. Keeping God's word together. This was a poem that was written to the entire church. And something powerful happens when we gather on Sundays, when we gather in our small groups, and we speak God's word into each, each and every one of our lives. And then finally, keep it carefully. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against. We should be careful to keep God's word so close to our hearts that we would indeed memorize it as the Holy Spirit uses it to speak to us at different ways at different times. And then finally, the greatest reward of God's word is relationship. Is you get to know the love of God. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John 15. Mike began the service by reading for us from John 15. The greatest reward of the word of God is the God of the word. And when we open our Bibles, we're reminded of this. And Jesus even said this in verse 10 of John 15. He said, if you keep my commandments, all these keeping, you will abide in my love, in his love. 
just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I can't wait to read my Bible. I want to know the love of the Lord even more so. I want to be filled with a joy that I'm never going to find on the store on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. And it's here. And so what John Piper says in light of this, on this quote above me, the challenge before us, I'll read it out loud because it's in size 8, my fault. The challenge before us is not merely to do what God says because he is God, but to desire what God says because he is good. The challenge is not merely to pursue righteousness, but prefer righteousness. The challenge is to get up in the morning and prayerfully meditate on the scriptures until we experience joy and peace in believing the precious and very great promises of God. And with this joy set before us, the commandments of God will not be burdensome, and the compensation of sin will appear too brief and too shallow to lure us. There is great reward in God's word. And so here's what I invite, invite and encourage you to do this week. Read your Bible and remember that Jesus keeps his people. First and foremost, Jesus keeps his people. And then keep reading, believing, and trusting God's word. Day in and day out. And finally, keep relating with God, not just reading words. Keep relating with God, not just reading words. And in that, we find great reward. But not only that, in verse 12, we see that God's word brings about revelation of our problem and God's pardon. Look with me at verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Who can discern his errors? I love the Christmas cards. And I love the Christmas colors, the greens and the reds for days. And next week, we're going to decorate this place as though we've never seen it decorated before. Chuck even got the decorations down for us already. And the great part of Christmas colors is that green and red is a beautiful display if you can see them. But unfortunately, I and about 10% of the male population have green, red color blindness. And so you put green and red next to each other, and for me, it's a pick em. I got no idea where one starts and the other ends. And so thankfully, if I want to look festive in attire, I have a wife who is perfectly qualified and competent to put outfits together, including green and red. So if I ever show up in green on green, know that Jen's very sick. <laughs> I went with blue on blue and rolled the dice today. <laughs> But what David is telling us here is, as I can't see colors that are very similar, I am colorblind, you and I have a spiritual blindness. That when we hear God's word convict us of sin, we look in the mirror of our hearts and say, not me. <laughs> that must be applying to someone else. And so David is asking the rhetorical question, who can discern his errors? And it's no one. There is no answer given. And this is King David. The king who seduced, who murdered, who lied, and tried to cover it up. And so he's talking about his errors. Errors in the original is what would refer to those unintentional and even undesirable sins that we would commit. Things that we have almost slipped into habitually. Where you've grown used to thinking your boss is so terrible that that anger is so justified. Those kids are so impatient. Well, they deserved my wrath. Or maybe my way of relating with people, I see that people are increasingly moving away from instead of closer towards me, but it's all their problem. They're too sensitive. And so David is saying, I need help. I don't know the depth of my depravity, and neither do you or myself. And so how do we discern our errors with God's word? Well, here's what I think would be advisable in light of this passage. We let the word read us as we read it. You are going to come across passages where the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. And what you can be doing as you're reading your Bible is saying, how does this passage convict me of my sin or my need for ongoing growth and godliness? Not just how does it convict my neighbor or my children or my spouse, but me. And not just let the word read us, but let the church help us. 
there are over a hundred one another's in the New Testament. And this tells us that following Jesus flourishes as a meaningful member of a local church. That there are times when we need to graciously and lovingly help one another see the blind spots of our own sin. And we don't go into this kind of like you go out hunting in the fields with your bows and your guns just willing to shoot up anything that moves on four legs. We don't go into our sin struggles in the church of saying, I just want to destroy whoever has the sin problem. But we go into it as teammates in pursuit of holiness. That we speak the truth in love, full of grace and full of truth, that we would grow up into the likeness of Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 3 tells us this on the screen above me. Hebrews 3. I encourage you to keep this fresh in your minds this week. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in you any evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In light of that passage, who in this church knows you well enough to speak lovingly and convictingly in areas of your sin struggles? Are you allowing yourself to be known in a small group, a men's group, a women's group, just a time of regular gathering with other people where you open the word and say, help me see what I don't see? Help me to see the spots where I need to grow in godliness? And do you receive that invitation and instruction humbly and lovingly? Notice David says, who can discern his errors? And the answer is no one. And then so he stops leaning on his own power and he declares to God. He says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Declare me. Give me a new status. Help me. Notice what he's not saying. I will do this. David is not saying it's just a little behavior modification that makes us right with God. No, no, no. David is no longer excusing. He's no longer hiding. He's no longer blame shifting his sin onto anyone else. He's saying, declare me. Just in this May, we don't know exactly what time in his life this psalm was written, but it could have been after his sin with Bathsheba. The murder, the adultery, the lying. And now he's no longer behavior modification. He's grieved over the fact that he has not just been caught in his sin, but he's grieved that he has sinned against God and others. This is godly grief instead of worldly sorrow. See, worldly sorrow will lead us to just try to excuse or blame our sin away or hide from it. But godly godly grief leads to repentance without regret, as 2 Corinthians 7.10 says. And so what David is inviting us to do is not stand on behavior modification, but God's justification. David says, declare me. It's a humble plea. And declare me innocent. It's the words in the original that would mean more of acquit me, make me righteous, justify me. And what David longed for is who we see in the fullness of Christ Jesus, that Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. And he became born in the man and took on likeness to become our servant, as Philippians 2 would better say than I just did. But God made him to be sin, who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so the invitation is to receive God's pardon, that his pardon is the only means to be free of the penalty of your sin. And so therefore, I would encourage you, when you come face to face with your sin, that you would mourn your sin instead of being mad that you got caught. Stop blaming, stop excusing, stop hiding. It's not anyone else's fault. But mourn our sin, not just being mad that we're caught, but then to receive holiness humbly. To say, I can't just stand on behavior modification. No one's a Christian because they got their stuff together. Christ Jesus came down and lived and died and rose because we can't get our stuff together. But through him, we can receive the declaration of innocence of once for all made right in his status. And then if we believe this, we will confess personally instead of blame broadly. We will look at the log in our eye before the speck in our neighbor's eye. And we will say, you know what? I want God's grace to continually change me.
into the likeness of Christ. And that's what David asked for next. Verse 13. We need revelation to see our sin and his pardon, but we need rescue by his power from our pride. Look at verse 13. David then asked, powerfully asked, keep back your servant. Hold me back. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. I just can't help myself. You ever felt like that? I know someone in my family who has. Grown up, we love Christmas cards, we love Christmas colors, we love Christmas carols, and especially Christmas cookies. Christmas cookies, the sweetest of all treats this time of year. And growing up, my mom had a famous oatmeal cookie recipe. And they were actually cookies because there was no raisins in them. So oatmeal cookies that she would make by the dozen for us to take to school and give to our teachers back when you could take things that had sugar in them as snacks for school. And so she made dozens of these cookies and bagged them up for me to grab early the next morning and take them to school. But overnight, my big old dog, 120-pound dog, Maggie, Bernie's Mountain Dog, she had a plan. She smelled and saw where those cookies were. And she was big enough to get on that kitchen counter and consume every last crumb to her demise. Her desire led to her demise. She devoured more than she could digest. She could not keep herself back from what she wanted but knew was not good for her. David is saying the exact same thing is true about us. That sin allures us in. It promises us something like the smell of those cookies for Maggie promised her the satisfaction of her stomach. We go to those websites, those drinks, those pills, that anger, that vengeful, harsh speaking. We go there because it promises us something. It brings about the false aroma of life to our souls. But it's an aroma that if we were to digest it would lead to our demise. And so what David is saying is, you need God's pardon to be right with God, but you need his power to be kept back from those presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins means those high-handed, I will do whatever I want, no matter what God has decreed. Thank you very much. I'll eat every last crumb of those cookies sort of sins. Those times when you know God's word calls you to love your wife as Christ loved the church, but you're so busy with your hobby that you haven't had time for a date in weeks. It's those sins where you know you shouldn't speak in anger at that colleague or that boss, that no corrupting talk should come out of your mouth, but only as grace that would give grace and build those others up, but you're just going to make sure they feel your wrath. You feel it, you hear it in the word, and you still do it. And so David says, keep me back. Help me to be restrained. And so the question for you is, where might you pridefully push ahead when God has intentionally said no? Where might you be most prone to pridefully push against God's word and ahead in your desire, even though he has intentionally said no, no, no? And then David says even further, let them not have dominion over me. See, sin is dangerous because it wants to have dominion. It's a word that means reign, rule. Think about dynasty, like the Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys of the 1990s, or the Yankees of the 1990s of the sports world, teams that dominated one win after another. And what sin has the habit of doing in our lives is it wins one victory after another until we feel so far submerged between the habits and the pattern that we can't get ourselves out. And so David is saying, let them not have dominion over me. Let us not continue to say no to the spirit and yes to the flesh. Because as we continue to say no to the spirit, as we continue to say no to the spirit of God in the word and yes to our flesh, it like greases the wheels of rebellion. It makes it that much easier the next time to continue in patterns of sin. And so J.C. Ryle really well-known pastor of a former generation, he says this. He says, resist sin in its beginnings. They may look small and insignificant, but resist them. Make no compromise. 
Let no sin lodge quietly and undisturbed in your heart. Put up with a few little sins, and you will soon want a few more. David knew this. His unfortunate demise began with taking a day off of work. And it's not bad to take a day off of work, but in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, the troops went out to war and David stayed home for an entire season. And for us, it's that invitation to ask, what sins most threaten to dominate you in this season? What sin struggle may most threaten to overwhelm and overcome your desire for God and your love for others? And if left unaddressed, what would that lead to? What sort of difficulty would it lead to in your love for God and love for others? And so David finally says, let them not have dominion over me, but then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Then he's saying something's going to happen to him in the future. That the good news of God's pardon, the power of God's protection will create an increased growth and purity within him. See, one of the good things about getting those Christmas cards, especially year after year, I get to see families grow up. Even if it's one card year after another, the little kids become big kids, and the grown-ups become grandparents. And before you know it, you see this change that you celebrate. And David, in a likewise way, is saying, increasingly so, as we go to God's word and it continues to reform and change us, we grow into the likeness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us, as we behold the glory of God, we are transformed from one degree of glory to another. That the church together, we don't just grow old in age, we grow older in godliness. That we speak the truth in love to one another. And so David is saying that as God's word continues to be the ultimate authority in his life and practice, he's increasingly growing in purity. Isn't that what you want? If in 2023 we want nothing else, wouldn't it be growth in godliness? And David is saying, I will be innocent, blameless. He's remembering for us, reminding us that there is this positional sanctification. When you are pardoned through faith in Jesus, your past, present, future sin is seen as acquitted. You are blameless once and for all time. But then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 says, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That none of us are perfect. And none of us will be perfect until Christ returns. And until he does, the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives inside every believer. And he is growing you more and more into the likeness of Christ as we submit to the word, as we listen to and follow him. And so what do we do? How do we continue to grow in godliness in light of God's pardon and his power? Well, there's a few particular ways. I want us to battle with sin because we've been delivered from the penalty and are being delivered from its power by God. And so first and foremost, that means you battle as a spiritual son instead of a slave to sin. Romans 6.11 says that we would not present our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness, but as right to righteousness unto Christ. If you have been adopted through faith in Christ Jesus, and you are now a son of God, that you pursue holiness as a means of growing in the family likeness, that you are increasingly made like your older brother, so to say, Christ Jesus, who is indeed perfect in all moral attributes. And then you also seek greater joy than you would see in Christ and in Jesus, and then in sin. That there is more to be had in Christ than there is in whatever toys or trinkets of this world would tempt us. And then finally, you continue to go to Scripture. I put a few common struggles that I hear from uh, from many of us often. There are certain passages that speak directly to sin struggles. Because there are certain sin struggles that seem to be repeated all throughout the ages. And so on that list, there may be one that speaks particularly to you. And if you need other passages that would help you this week, talk to one of me, myself or one of the elders who will give you spiritual shepherding towards that. And then remember that you're strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that you don't battle sin on your own, 
but the Spirit who rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. And so prayerfully, we depend on him. And so he brings about rescue from our pride by his power. And finally, verse 14, he gives us renewal in our praise towards him. Verse 14, David concludes, he says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David has nothing to say but thank you and please help. Thank you and please help. It reminds me after this Thanksgiving break, after my loved ones, particularly Gigi and Poppy, have fed our family to the abundance and even sent us home with leftovers, all that I can do after receiving their grace is say thank you. Those are the only words and the feelings of my heart that are appropriate towards them. And what David is saying for us is, when you see how perfect God has been towards us, when you realize he's given his son unto life, death, and resurrection, then all that we can do in return is then say, God, please help the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you. Help me to praise you as you see as you deserve it. And so what he is saying is we worship God not for salvation but from salvation. That the renewal and the reformation that we long to see will only happen to the degree that his grace has gripped your heart. Until his grace radically renovates and grips your heart, you will just try to be a better person. But when you see that the perfect person, Christ Jesus, has come to live, die, rise, and will soon return, well, then you will see this life and every second of it as a forum to worship the one who showed perfect faithfulness to you. Tim Keller says this. He says, God's salvation does not come in response to a changed life. A changed life comes in response to the salvation offered as a free gift. And that free gift changes us. David says, let the words of my mouth, all the things that would speak from our mouths this week, that they would bless God, that they would praise God, that they would bless those around you, no longer burdening others with harsh or cold communication, but instead blessing one another. What if every word this week were seeking the physical, the emotional, the spiritual betterment of someone else? What a week that would be. Good luck getting through the end of today. But imagine if God's grace gripped us to the extent that the words in my mouth were acceptable in God's sight all the time. And not only that, we can share God's word with the lost, not only encouraging those in our church, but we can speak this word to those who may not know him. The most loving thing you could do is share this word. And I was even reminded in John Newton, a man who was radically converted toward the end, latter parts of his life. And on his dying days, you know what? He said all the words that could come out of his mouth were this. I am a great sinner. Christ is a great Savior. If I said nothing else every day this week, it'd be a good week. I am a great sinner. Christ is a great Savior. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart all those thoughts, those meditations, those prayers, what if every single one of them, the ones I was anxious about in the evening, the ones I was eager to tackle in the morning, what if I gave those over to God in prayer before I tried to strive and do them on my own? What if my goal was that my words and my prayers would be acceptable in God's sight? That everything I did this week was not for just the affirmation of my peers, my family, my colleagues, my boss, but I would seek to Hear, well done, good and faithful servant for my heavenly Father. See, if our ultimate end is to please God, there's no limit into how much good we could be to others. If our ultimate end were to please God, there is no ceiling on how much good we could be to others this week, even in our speaking and our praying, speaking to and praying for them. And so no wonder David finally says, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer the rock and redeemer who we sung about earlier this morning. A term of refuge, a, a redeemer is the kinsman in the Old Testament language who would buy someone back from the difficulty that they would otherwise be in. You can think of like Boaz in the story of Ruth. And here we sit on this side 
of what David longed to see and knowing that our Redeemer is Christ Jesus. That he has indeed suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God, to buy us back. He is indeed, Psalm 19 has been pointing us to the word of God, but Jesus is the word become flesh. And so over these four weeks, we've been invited to see and to celebrate him. And so in John 1, we conclude our time together, and we remember that the word of God points us to the God who took on flesh, the God of the word in Christ Jesus. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. In keeping these, there is great reward. And the greatest reward we will ever know is new life with Christ. And so in light of all that we've heard in Psalm 19 over the last four weeks, I invite you to receive the reward of relationship with Christ through faith in him, that you would know the revelation of your need and his pardon, that he would continue to rescue you from your own pride by his power, and you'd even be renewed in your praise, in your speaking, your singing, your thinking, your living, that it would be acceptable in his sight. In his name we pray. Amen. At this point, we're going to invite the children to come back into the room. Um, Larry's going to come back forward, and he's going to lead us in a song of praise. And I'll invite you all to join us in that song by standing and singing.